recently in 2019, I found my bell ridge oil, which I thought would never happen to me, but I know God loves me. And uh, so in, in 2019, I found this company in Turkey, which was basically trading at 3% of liquidation value, very similar to Bellridge. And, and unlike Bellridge, or maybe not quite unlike, because Bellridge eventually, I think Shell pulled out something like 40, 50 billion of oil from that oil field, and it's still flowing today. But this company in Turkey, not only is it, was it a three cent dollar bill, it's growing its value. And in fact, in the last three years, it may have doubled its value. I was buying something with a market cap of 20 million that was probably worth at least 600 or 700 million. It's probably worth something like at least a billion and a half today. And it's going to keep going. So I may not need to do a cross connect. All I may need to do, which is very difficult to do, is do nothing for a very long period of time. Like Rip Van Winkle, just go to sleep. So I could either go to sleep for 20 years or I could spend 20 years talking to the wonderful students at LSE. So <clears throat> I hope you will invite me back because I need something to do for 20 years because I, do, I have literally got nothing to do now. I just have to twiddle my thumbs and make sure there's no sell orders placed. And so one way you can get the 100Xs is and to take a step back. There's 50,000 or so publicly traded companies around the planet. All their prices are set in a auction driven format, like horse racing, the pari mutual system. So the way prices are set on the New York Stock Exchange, the way the odds are determined on the race course are identical. Basically it's the buyers and sellers that set the price. And because of the auction driven nature of the market, so. If we have a private company, we have a gas station. They want to sell the other station. They want to sell that petrol station. You're generally going to have intelligent buyers facing an intelligent seller. And you'll come up with some price that will be close to the actual value of the gas station. But when you have auction driven market, you have a lot of undershooting and overshooting that happens all the time. In 2022, we saw a lot of overshooting right? A lot of high flyers, a lot of great businesses got really a year ago, for whatever reason, these auction participants gave Facebook slash Meta Labs a certain valuation. And then by the end of the year, they had taken it out back and shot it. The same business, not much has changed. But in, in the course of a year, there was a dramatic change in valuation. And if Meta had been a private company, and they tried to sell themselves a year ago, and they were trying to sell themselves today, the Delta may not be anywhere near the way it is in the equity market. So when we see the undershooting of, of securities, that gives us some possibilities. And then you might say that this is so hard, 50,000 stocks. And if you ask Warren that, he would say, start with the A's. And, and Buffett actually went through in the 1950s, he went through something known as the Moody's Manual, which listed all these companies, there are four companies on a page, very thin pages, big thick, big thick books. And I bought a couple of Moody's Manual on eBay a few years back, just for nostalgia's sake. And, uh, but he would go through each company and there were thousands of companies and they just had basic balance sheet and income statement data. And he ran some classes with MBA students a few years back. And he would find a company where the earnings were $15 million a year and the market cap was 25 million, things like that. It's just things that, that made no sense. And when he found these things that made no sense, then he would dig into those. And he did really well. To take a step back, going back to horse racing, you know who we are as humans at the age of five and who we are at the age of 95 there is no change. Basically, our personality template, our traits, our likes and dislikes, who we are, is pretty much hard-coded at the age of five. And between your genetics and your experiences in the first five years of life, that die is cast. 
And after that, there's not going to be any change. Buffett, when he was a young teenager in Omaha, he used to go to the local racetrack, Aksarban, which is Nebraska spelt backwards. And what he'd do is after the, all the races had been run, he'd collect all the tickets that people had discarded and thrown on the ground. And he'd collect them all. He'd bring them home. And he'd go through each one carefully to see if some drunk guy had thrown away a winning ticket. And lo and behold, he would actually find a few tickets, which actually were winners, but people had thrown them away. And then because he was underage, he couldn't go to the window to cash it. So he would send his aunt Alice with these tickets to cash them in. And so the kid who was doing that at the age of 12 was the same kid who at the age of 26 or something was thumbing through the Moody's manual in 1956 or 57. And one time my friend Guy Spear and I visited his office in, uh, in Omaha. I think this must have been like 2010 or 2011. We used to go have lunch once a year with Buffett's assistant, Debbie Bozanik. And uh, we paid a good amount of money to have lunch with Buffett. But quite frankly, the lunches with Debbie were a lot more fun. And uh, I learned a lot from Debbie. And uh, one, one year, I think 2010 or 2011 or thereabouts, we had gone to have lunch with Debbie. And when I went to the 14th floor of Kivit Plaza with Guy Spear, Warren was standing right at the elevator like to receive us. We didn't really have a, we didn't have an appointment with him or anything. And he says to us, would you like a tour of headquarters? I said, Warren, if you want to hang out with a couple of yo-yos, it's perfectly fine with us. You've got nothing to do twiddling your thumbs. And so he gave us a great tour of the headquarters, showing us all the mementos and different things. And then he took us to his office, his private office. And there I saw on his desk, the Japan company handbook, which is basically just like the Moody's manual. It's like value line for Japan. And they have two companies on one page, lists every Japanese company. And he was thumbing to it. Now Berkshire's managing tens or hundreds of billions at that point. And you can't be playing these Mickey Mouse games with the Aksarban tickets and stuff. So I had actually been going through the Moody's manual, just coincidentally, the Japan company handbook, just coincidentally, before I actually went to the office. So I, I took his copy of the Japan company handbook and I said, Warren, I'm going to like dog ear some pages that I found interesting that uh, you might find interesting. Now, I don't know if, whether he was horrified that I was taking his Japan company handbook and mutilating it. But I just went ahead and did that. And, uh, and a lot of the companies that I thought were these super cheap companies, statistically, were towards the back of the book. He says, yeah, what I found is the good stuff is always at the back. And uh, so the kid at 12, the kid at 26, the kid at 81 or 82, it was the same kid. No change. No change at all because, and the kid today is the same too. So Munger would say, when you say, oh, this is so much work and this and that, Munger's answer would be, why should it be easy to get rich? Why should it be so easy for you to find the three cent dollar bill? But what I'm here to tell you is the three cent or two cent or one cent dollar bill is sitting there. It's there today, it's there tomorrow, it's there five years from now. The only question is, how determined are you to find it? And how many pages are you willing to flip? How many rocks are you willing to turn over? And like this company in Turkey, it's like one and done. I don't think God loves me so much that I'm going to find another one. But I still keep looking. I'm still hunting. One and done is perfectly fine with me. It's better than zero and done. So all of you are really young. You're really smart. You have a lot of tools and resources to look up all of these companies, start with the A's, or maybe it might be better to start with the Z's because the stuff is the good stuff in the back and all the best. The second approach is where you identify a great compounder that because of people not willing to look at the right time horizon, then you can look around the corner. You could pay what would be either a reasonable or even an expensive looking price and end up with a great result. So if we are, if we have a crystal ball that can tell us what a company might look like 50 years from now, 
30 years from now then you know we could buy something at a billion dollar market cap and it might become 200 billion and for me personally that is a lot harder game to learn and play i would like to do that but so i'm open to both games i think for me personally the first game might be a tad easier and and because we have these auction driven markets and because people vacillate between fear and greed we can get there 